sometime later this week. All right, so as I promised, what I'm gonna talk about today uh, is just a very basic system, uh, bosons, uh, just a single species of boson, uh, interacting with uh, short range repulsive interaction. Uh, it's typically useful to put the bosons on a lattice. Uh, so this, you know, before about 2000, this wasn't uh, uh, really a realistic physical situation, but with the advent of ultrapole atoms, uh, you can now take bosons with uh, BI and put them on some lattice. Uh, I'll generally assume we are in two or higher dimensions, although many things I'm going to say also apply in one dimension. So these are the Bose operators with a canonical Bose commutation relation. Uh, Ni is the boson number. So there's a hopping matrix element, which I'll call W. Uh, repulsion between the bosons, any pair of bosons has a repulsion energy U, and mu is the chemical potential. So we want to understand the phase diagram of this model um, as say at zero temperature uh, as a function of two parameters, uh, the ratio of uh, mu to W uh, and the ratio of U to W. And that already gives you quite an interesting uh, uh, structure that uh, we'll probably describe this week or maybe next week. All right, uh, to, but, but to begin with, I'm going to consider the dilute case, or the, sorry, the weakly interacting case. Uh, um, so U uh, is much, much less than W, and also some other parameters that will depend on the density that we'll specify more carefully later. Uh, so then there's some dispersion for the bosons. Uh, which you get by taking the Fourier transform of this of this W. Uh, there's a dispersion like this in the Berlin zone. Uh, and if U is exactly zero, then the bosons will uh, basically all occupy uh, the zero momentum state, uh, the lowest energy state. So we'll put this at, at momentum zero. Um, and near this point, uh, I'll sometimes take it's called, this is a definition of M, if you wish. Uh, I'll assume the dispersion is quadratic right at the bottom of the mat. Okay, uh, and that, of course, this theory, when I'm just focusing the bottom of the band, uh, applies also to helium-4, but there's no lattice, which is where uh, some of what I'm gonna talk about first was initially worked out. So if I have N particles and the interaction U is exactly zero, uh, then the ground state, is you just put every particle, uh, now this is k equals zero uh, in, in, in the zero momentum state. So you have n particles and it takes a b dagger k equals zero in the n particle state. Uh, and bk uh, is defined as one over square root of the volume. Uh, so on i b i minus uh, e to the i k r. Okay, so the BK also, because of the factor of square root of volume, I have the usual anti commutation relation. Oh, sorry, a commut commutation relation that these with different momenta uh, commute with each other, uh, and, and those with the same have unit commutator. Okay, uh, so this is the ground state. And what are the excited states? Well, the excited states, uh, if I plot the excitation, um, you know, you can take a particle out of the ground state and put it into an excited state. And, and so it'll have a dispersion as a function of k, uh, which will basically mirror this. So you can uh, take a particle out of the condensate and move it up to some momentum k, and that will cost you an energy, which is at least a small k goes as k squared. We're not going to talk about what happens up here, uh, at least in today's lecture. Okay, so that's at u equals zero. Things are very simple. Uh, you can also turn on a finite temperature, uh, and that you can get a Bose Einstein condensation temperature that was originally worked out by uh, Bose and Einstein in the 20s, uh, where this condensed where, where a macroscopic number of particles above the temperature are not present at zero momentum. All right, so today what I want to begin with is the small view theory. 
Uh, that's often called the boggle bog theory. And one of the things we'll find immediately that no matter how small is u, uh, u is this is not correct, that the excitation spectrum doesn't look like this, doesn't go as k squared as small k, uh, but the actual excitation spectrum, uh, which we're going to find out in a little bit, will be capital E of k as a function of k, uh, initially goes linearly and then goes quadratically. So there's some regime here. Uh, this is for u not equal to zero, no matter how small where it goes linearly with k, and then at, at larger k, it has a k squared over 2m dispersion. So what we'll say is that there's a qualitative change uh, in this kind of excitation, which is just a single particle excitation, uh, to what we sometimes call the collective excitation. Uh, on, and this, this particular excitation is often called second sum. So that's what I want to illustrate in the first calculation I'm going to present. Uh, where does this come from? Uh, the mode of understanding of this is really uh, what we call a Goldstone mode. Uh, it's a low energy mode associated with the fact that the ground state breaks a certain symmetry, which is the symmetry associated with particle number conservation. Uh, and we'll see how that happens uh, in this model at small u. Uh, this is called second sum, but that's a bit misleading. Uh, in the sense that uh, it's not like ordinary sound, first sound, which is really due to, which happens when you have lots of collisions between particles. It's that's a true hydrodynamic mode in a regime where the frequency of the sound is much lower than the frequency of the collisions. Uh, this is uh, really a coherent excitation, so collisionless excitation, um, and uh, uh, yeah, it's called second sound, but I would have called it something else. But anyway, that's what we'll start with. Okay, um, so let's see how this uh, this happens. It's uh, uh, small non-zero u. Okay, so the second sound also in superconductivity. People talk about it. Right? Uh, so in, in superconductivity, when you have long-range interactions, uh, this becomes a plasma. It goes to high energy uh, because of Coulomb interaction. So this is for short-range interaction. So the second sound yeah, is basically the plasma, uh, which is also a coherent excitation, but it's got a gap. So that's the original motivation for the Higgs mechanism, where a long range interaction can get rid of the Goldstone mode uh, and give it a gap. Oh, okay. Um, all right, so, so let's proceed then. All right. So we're going to, it's useful to think about this in the grand canonical ensemble. Um, and I'm going to go to momentum space. Uh, and write the Hamiltonian now. Uh, let's see. Yeah, okay. Uh, I have to make sure I got everything right. Okay. Uh, so the Hamiltonian in, in momentum space is someone K, epsilon K, uh, B dagger K, B K. Uh, minus mu, sum on k, d dagger k d k, uh, plus u over 2v, sum on k, k prime and q, uh, v dagger k, v dagger i, b k prime, plus q, b k prime, minus q. So one thing you notice uh, right away is that this thing, this expression is what, is what we call normal order, where all the annihilation operators to the left of the creation, all the creation operators to the left of the annihilation operators, uh, whereas this one isn't. Uh, but when you normal order this, the minus one is just what you need uh, to give you exactly this expression. Okay. Um, so we now, first, the first thing we want to do is just take uh, put everything uh, in the zero moment. Pick out only D zero. So now, from now on, when I put a zero, I mean zero momentum, uh, not not the side label. Uh, so then, what is the Hamilton? 
of this energy, including the chemical potential, what does it look like? Well, this gives you nothing because EK is zero. Uh, this will give you minus mu uh, B zero uh, uh, dagger T zero dagger. Um, and uh, yeah, B zero okay. dagger B zero. Sorry, excuse me. <laughs> All right, I should actually uh, just to keep. Uh, I'll try to follow the notation in my notes. <laughs> Let me call uh, N0 now. B dagger zero, B zero. And so this will be minus uh, mu N0 plus U over two uh, N0 times. Uh, okay, I hope I haven't made a mistake here. <coughs> uh, U over two V. One. Okay, that's correct. In this triple sum, do you have all the momentum labels correct? Uh, thank you. There's no pride over there. Yeah. Okay, so now the way we're thinking about it, uh, we're working the grand canonical ensemble that fits mu. Uh, and so we have to find the optimal value of N0 uh, at any given mu. And this is the, the grand energy. So now we just look at the expectation value uh, of the Hamiltonian in this state with n0 particles. Uh, this is equal to that. And we want to demand that this is uh, equal to zero. Um, and so that would give us an equation for uh, n0. Uh, so this is equal to zero. And when you solve this, you'll find that uh, n little n zero, which is n zero over v, this is the density of particle zero momentum state, is just mu over u zero. So now what we find is always a macroscopic number of particles zero momentum state, uh, and that's determined by the chemical potential. You notice this is very singular as u goes to zero. Uh, this becomes so. Uh, this, so mu has to be proportional to u0 in a particular way to get the low density limit. Uh, but that's a preferable way to work. All right, so that's the, that's another way of restating the very simple facts over here. Uh, but now let's go to include the particles at non-zero momentum. Okay. Any questions from the audience? What is u zero, Sameer? Does this work down there? No, it doesn't. Hi, Sameer, can you hear me? All right, so the, the next step is to include uh, the particles at non-zero momentum, include uh, BK uh, at K not equal to zero and assume they are small. And in any given, uh, in some units that will become clear later, uh, the expectation values associated with each such operator uh, is small. So basically you just take this Hamiltonian, you pull out B0 as special, and then you expand the remaining terms uh, in powers of BK, with K not equal to zero. So when you do that, uh, you get the famous probably about Hamiltonian, which is H is equal to uh, the leading term, which is minus mu n naught, plus u naught, u over two, n naught squared. That's exactly these two terms over here. Notice there's a term here, the minus one, that we can throw out because relative to the n naught, which is going to be macroscopic, this is completely negligible. So this we throw out. Uh, but now they're going to be contributions from finite momentum modes. Those will still be extensive because there's extensive number of momenta. Okay. And so from the sum of k not equal to zero, we're going to get 
of Xj minus mu with u, u and zero of B dagger K. Okay. And it's useful to write it in this way, u and zero over two. Um, B dagger K that minus K plus B minus K B. All right, so these are the quadratic terms in the original Hamiltonian. While you keep uh, keeping terms to all orders in B0, but only quadratic order at K not equal to zero. Okay, uh, so now, and this is some quadratic Hamiltonian, so the Bogolyubov theory really consists on just diagonalizing this Hamiltonian. Um, but one peculiar thing you notice is that the number of bosons seems to appear to be not conserved. Uh, you have terms here that annihilate pairs of bosons uh, and terms here that create pairs of bosons. Whereas the original Hamiltonian uh, preserved the number of bosons. So what's going on here? Well, what's happening is that, of course, when I create a pair of bosons at non-zero momenta, I have to remove a pair of bosons from the condensate. Uh, and so there will be two factors of B0 over there uh, that are just replaced uh, by by n zero. So here are one further thing I've done um, is I have uh, replaced b zero <coughs> dagger zero is approximately square root of n zero. So the point here is that this minus one that we threw out was a consequence of the fact that b zero doesn't commute with b zero dagger. Um, but since these, the number of particles in that state is so large, they're kind of a classical limit. And we can treat B0 and B dagger, B0 dagger as just classical numbers because the commutator is one, whereas their value itself is all the square root of n, which is a very large number. So that's where the concept non conservation of particles arises. I'm not keeping track of B0 and B0 daggers, I'm really replacing them by a, by a number. Uh, which is the condensate, the Bose condensate. All right. I guess here you're assuming that the, the thing that has an expectation value is the field itself, like B0. Yes, yeah, so B0 is condensed. It's a number. Yeah, you're, 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 we're not supposed to diagonalize N0. But you're, you're... Um, yeah, so we will do this in a more field theoretical way in, in, uh, in, in a few minutes. First, I want to do it the way Bogolyubov did it, using operators, uh, and the reasoning you know, Bogolyubov didn't have the reasoning of broken symmetry, which we'll get to. Um, he was arguing in terms of just uh, having the zero momentum modes being essentially classical complex numbers. Um, in, in fact, more generally, there, there's a phase here, which I've just said equal to zero, uh, to unity, this factor. And this is the phase that will turn out to be uh, I'm just questioning this, this type of reasoning because uh, it kind of obscures the fact that we have the field, right? Yeah, well, <laughs> if, 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 we, if we had diagonalized N0, we would get the different answer. If you had diagonalized N0? Yeah. Yeah. We get the terms that have to. Uh, All right. I, I agree. This is, this is not the best way to, uh, to, uh, to understand things. And I'm going to present the improved way, which I, I'm sure you'll like better. Uh, but this is just to make to do it the simple way first, and then we'll get to a more sophisticated way of looking at it. Yeah, I know exactly where you're heading, but yes, I'm trying to put my head in the framework of the way it's phrased here. Yeah, the original system has a finite number of particles, right? And B's and B daggers with the conversation relation, right? So the system has some n, which is a correct a number, no correct. symmetry is being broken. Yeah. And the Hamiltonian has to respect that symmetry. Every time you annihilate a particle, you have to create another one. Yeah. So this description that you've presented here must be an approximation that distorts these basic facts. Uh, yes. So it is an approximation, and it's valid in the limit of n naught is very large. 
Um, and it will give you some, if you measure certain correlation functions, it will give you uh, some results that may seem unphysical, that seem to violate the particle number conservation. Because if I just look at the expectation value of V0, I'm saying that it's non-zero. Whereas in, in the real system, it's not. Okay. Uh, but if you just take a box, <clears throat> yeah, which has some fixed number of bo the bosons, right? That number is not going to change. Correct. You have some Schrodinger problem with these uh, bosons and some symmetric wave. I mean, the number of coordinates of this wave function is not going to change. Absolutely. So that's of course, yeah. So let, let me just defer that. That's a great question. That's precisely the next point. Uh, but let me just complete this calculation. And we'll come to all of that. Uh, okay. All right. So now we just face the mechanical task of diagonalizing this Hamiltonian to the quadratic boson Hamiltonian. Uh, and that's diagonalized by what's called the bogley bob transformation. Uh, you just take a linear combination of BK and B dagger of minus K. So you introduce a new operator. Um, so which I call eta K. So you introduce a new set of bosons, which I call eta K. And eta k has the usual boson computation relation. Uh, and you define your bk, the uh, eta k cosh, eta k minus eta dagger minus k times sinh of theta k. So this theta k is an arbitrary parameter right now. And the cosh and cinch have been chosen uh, to ensure that this relation here is uh, compatible with the original relation, which is that BK, B dagger K, commutator is delta K, K prime. Okay. And so that you can easily check for any theta K, this, these two are consistent with each other. So now you insert this, uh, this operator identity in here. And you expand the Hamiltonian in power of eta k. And of course, you choose the, the Hamiltonian so that there's no terms which involve um, eta, two powers of eta or two powers of eta dagger. <coughs> so when the dust settles, and this is uh, something you can work out for your own, you get an answer as sum on k, ek, eta dagger k, eta k. And now this EK is the object I drew earlier. Uh, is epsilon K squared plus two U naught epsilon N naught epsilon K. And there's also a formula for theta K, uh, which I'll just, I won't write it out. It's tan theta K equals something. Uh, it's in the notes. And also to obtain this formula, I had to use this fact that mu was equal to mu naught and naught. If you didn't use that, uh, you get an energy that has a finite value at finite k, uh, at any k. But now when you notice over here that this thing, as k goes to zero, this is negligible to this term. I mean, you take a square root, um, you get this linear dispersion that I promised, sound mode, uh, the second sound mode. Um, and the, the C over there is just given by this coefficient here. Okay. Uh, now, another calculation you can do is you can ask what is the ground state um, of this Hamiltonian? Well, the ground state of the Hamiltonian is very simple to write down. And this will start to address uh, Navi's points, I think. So, this will, I think, will be a homework problem. Uh, work out the ground state. Uh, of the Hamiltonian in the B language. So in the eta language, the ground state is very simple. Uh, eta k acting on the ground state must be zero because each capital EK is always a positive number. Uh, and so the lowest energy state is obtained by uh, annihilating it with, with eta k. <coughs> So then what does this mean in the B language? 
so this is an equation you have to solve. You have to put eta, an eta k in terms of pk, invert that relation, and solve this equation. I'll just write down schematically the form of the solution. So this implies that G uh, is equal to, uh, first of all, there's always P0 uh, dagger power of N0, the N0 particle in the condensate. Uh, but then you're going to get the exponential um, of um, some sum on K not equal to zero, some number FK that you'll work out, uh, which depends on theta K, uh, B dagger K, B dagger of minus K, acting on the vacuum of the boson. So the original uh, wave function of Bose and Einstein was just this. And Bogliubov theory, because of weak interaction, have given us this correction. Uh, so you can see what's happening here roughly. There's a large number of particles in the condensate. And every now and then, two particles go out of the condensate and go into uh, two, two momentum states, they're equal and opposite. You create this has net zero momentum, and you create particles in pairs at Kn minus k. So that's the wave function in this line. But obviously this wave function has some problems. Uh, it seems to have terms with different numbers of particles. There's a term with N zero particles, there's a term with infinite number of particles, you take a very high order term over here. Uh, whereas in any given box, in a real system, uh, this, the number of particles is fixed. Okay, so, so this is the, you say the ground state in the canonical ensemble. A grand canonical ensemble. So how do I get a ground state in the canonical ensemble? What is my trial wave function that I should really be using in a finite box? Well, the simplest way to do it is you just imagine you have n particles. You just put a projection, projection operator on the grand canonical ensemble. Uh, you just pick out the term, you expand the exponential out, and there'll be many, many terms which have exactly n particles. Just keep those and throw the others out. In fact, you can write down an explicit expression for this. It's an integral from zero to two pi of some angle d phi e to the minus i phi n. And what do you integrate? Well, you integrate this wave function let me create an ensemble of such weight functions. So let me change my notation. Uh, let me call this weight function phi. So this is some state with a definite value of phi. And every time I have a factor of b, I put in a factor of e to the i phi. And here I put e to the 2i phi. Okay, so this is, a, this is actually a valid state, valid ground state solution. Uh, of uh, in the Bogliubov theory. You can just rotate all the boson by a factor of phi, it won't change anything. The energies will remain exactly the same. So in fact, I had an infinite number of ground states in the grand one ensemble labeled by an angle phi, which I arbitrarily set to a constant. So there's a constant phi associated with every Bose creation operator. Uh, and then now you can see that this state here, let me call this phi now, uh, is just, exactly this state. So this integral will then pick out uh, exactly the state, uh, perform the projection operator and pick out the state with exactly n bosons. All right, so the modern way of saying this is that the ground state of uh, the uh, Bogdanova theory is a state at fixed phase phi. And if you want to fit, work in the fixed number basis, well, you're free to do that too by just integrating over phi. All right, but the physical quantum, in many ways, however, this state is a much, much better wave function uh, than this state. Uh, it obeys what's called a clustering property, uh, sometimes called a pure state, whereas this doesn't. Uh, so we'll invariably work with this state, and we just have to keep in mind uh, that uh, in reality, there's certain observables that are better computed with the projection. And the other important fact is also, if I'm looking at any kind of local observable, uh, this projection doesn't matter. Uh, and this is also something maybe I'll 
give as a homework problem. It's very similar to the proof in thermodynamics uh, of the fact that the canonical ensemble and the grand canonical ensemble give identical results in the thermodynamic limit. In exactly the same way, as long as you look at local observables, uh, this wave function phi or this wave function g have exactly the same properties as n goes to infinity. Uh, only for certain observables, they're different. But those are typically observable uh, that you're not interested in. Yes? Do you make any assumption here about how big the index i can be? Uh, so the index i? This thing started with b had an index i. Yeah, so that's about an n. Yeah. Uh, volume, that, that's an n are of the same order. And the index i takes over n values, capital N. You assume that there's some kind of periodic boundary condition here, I assume. Uh, and if you could take any boundary condition you want, as long as you're not looking near the boundary, it's fine. Uh, I'm just talking about intensive properties in the bulk. It doesn't really depend what the boundary conditions are. If you're interested in finite n corrections uh, and all kinds of you know, quantum dot type problems where n is not that large, then of course the boundary condition will matter. But in the thermodynamic limit, which is all I'm talking about now, uh, it doesn't matter. I thought that normally with a finite number of particles, there's no symmetry breaking. And then right. only the, the bottom state is valid. Correct, and yeah. The is only with the number of, not, not just n going to infinity, you also need the total number of values that I can take should go to infinity. Yeah, that's also about an n. I'm taking them to be the same, of the same order. Yeah. There's a finite density, so... It's, you know, if one is 10 to the 23, the other could be 0.1 times 10 to the 23, but they're all scaling together. Yes. Okay. All right, so this discussion brings me exactly to the next point, uh, which historically was first called off-diagonal long-range order. So the question really is, and this was really the origin, uh, you know, of the understanding of spontaneous symmetry breaking, uh, at least in finesse metaphysics, uh, I think it also influenced the development of particle physics. Uh, how, why is this state really thought of something that breaks a symmetry? Uh, it certainly wasn't so obvious we, yeah, uh, in Bogolyubov's formulation of it, but later on, I think it was on Sager, we first talked about what's called off diagonal long range order. So this is something yeah, very yeah, familiar question. Uh, to us today, but and has this peculiar name historically, at least in that's matter. So to understand off diagonal long range order, uh, let's define a field operator psi of R, which is really the same thing as bi on the lattice, but for, you know, I'll just use a different notation because we're soon going to use this uh, in the continuum. So this is one over square root of uh, V, so one K B K E to the I T K dot R. Okay, so let's compute the following quantity, uh, which is the correlation function psi diagonal of R. And let's do this in the Bogolyubov theory of R prime. We're going to look at this particular correlation function, remove a particle at point R prime, and put it back at point R. Uh, and if you write things in terms of the density matrix, uh, this is an off diagonal element of the one particle density matrix in the position basis, uh, hence the name off diagonal. That's really all that refers to. Uh, so, this thing you can now evaluate in the Bogolyubov theory. It's just the Fourier transform of someone K. K dot R is our prime. B dagger K B K. Expectation value. Uh, the off, the uh, different values of k prime don't contribute, uh, and this includes all k. So I'll leave the expression for you. In, uh, it's in the notes. I won't work it out. There's an explicit expression for what this thing is. It, you can convert it to some integral of some function, uh, and what you find that this is equal to uh, as r minus r prime goes to infinity. Uh, this is equal to, uh, in fact, exactly equal to n zero 
plus some function that decays, plus some function that will decay uh, with some power law. Some number here, some number here, uh, something that decays as R minus R prime goes to infinity. Uh, the full function is in the notes. Yes. Uh, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but is it possible to perhaps check? I think some of the students are asking some questions. Okay, please, yeah, okay. I don't know if it's... Uh, yeah. Thanks. Um, okay, so one of the questions was, can you mention the motivation to work with the grand canonical ensemble over the conventional Hamiltonian treatment? Uh, Yes, the motivation is really this is a much simpler wave function than this one right here. Uh, you don't want to keep doing this projection of these integrals all the time, whereas it's easy to just work in the grand canonical ensemble, which is fixed phi. You know, that's a lot simpler than having to do this projection. Uh, the other question is could theta take care be a complex number? I don't think so. Uh, theta has to be real, uh, otherwise, you lose some homoticity properties. Mm -hmm. Right, so the issue of all kind of long range order is that this correlation function, where you annihilate a particle at r prime uh, and create it at uh, r, goes to n zero. And just to be explicit, uh, let's say I'm computing this in the Pauli well theory in the phi state. Any phi state you want, and compute it, uh, and you'll get exactly the same answer. N zero as R minus R prime goes to infinity. All right, so the fact that there is uh, this long range correlation, that is you create, you annihilate a particle over here uh, and you know the wave function has some phase over there and then you put it back somewhere really, really far away uh, on the moon. And somehow the, uh, the phase there must be the same because you're getting a non-zero expectation value as R minus R prime goes to infinity. Okay, so this is the statement of octagonal long range order. Uh, and let's now see from this statement uh, why the five wave function in some ways is a much better wave function uh, than this G wave function. Let me just call it the N wave function. So, sorry, Dr. Octagonal yes. just means that X doesn't equal to X prime or R and R prime. Uh, excuse me, sorry? So octagonal just means that R does not equal R prime. Correct. Yeah, it's the octagonal matrix element of the one particle density matrix in the position basis. Yeah, so that was uh, what's called over DLRO. All right, so now if I look at the statement, I know this a, a very nice problem, which I want any reasonable theory to have uh, a sense of locality, uh, which is the, the statement that. Um, that limit r minus r prime uh, goes to infinity of psi dagger of r minus r prime. Uh, again, this is the phi state, sorry. Uh, is equal to uh, phi psi dagger of r phi. I have to normalize the state phi for this to be true. But with a with properly normalized state, this is correct. Because this is both, these are both equal to uh, n naught divided by the volume, which is little n naught. Notice this is not the total density, uh, it's the density in the condensate. This is n zero, not n. Okay, so, uh, and this is nice because it tells you that if I do something here in this room and I do something in India, it shouldn't matter. It's uh, really far away. It's the same state. I can just look locally at these expectation values. On the other hand, uh, what if I do this in the end basis? Uh, if I take the end particle and I compute this, uh, so this can also be, this is now a more complicated procedure. But I can do it just by using this trick. Once I know the answer for phi, I can uh, do this trick and work out the answer for, for n. Okay, so when you compute this, you'll find that this is equal to 
uh, exactly the same value, uh, even in the n basis. So that looks good for this kind of correlation function. It doesn't matter whether you work in the n basis or the phi basis. So this is an example of the type of correlator uh, involving some local observable that conserves number of particles. Uh, that makes no difference at all. And this is actually true for any such local observable. But now the, the unpleasant fact about the n basis, which you really want to work in, uh, but choose not to, is that this is not equal to uh, n psi dagger of r and and that's obviously the case because this is just zero. If you have a particle, fixed number of particles, you add a particle, you don't get a state the same number of particles. So in this case, we don't have this clustering property uh, where operators really <laughs> far away uh, uh, have independent expectations. Of. So that's really why ultimately we prefer to work with the five bases as long as you have an infinite system. Of course, you have a finite system, then you do have to worry about all of these differences, uh, but that's all I'll focus on for now. Okay. Uh, you notice you can take, this also tells you, you know, what's long range. The long range, what has long range order is phi, the phase of the, uh, of the Bose operator. Uh, it's the same at R and R prime, and that's long range order. And then now to understand, you know, the physics of the superfluid and, and why, uh, why you have, for instance, have this linear dispersion at low energies, uh, you want to consider states where phi is a function of space. Can we imagine state where phi varies as a function of time, where phi uh, is not the same here and there? Uh, that's really the heart of superfluidity, trying to understand states where this phi uh, can vary in space. Uh, that's a little tricky to do in the Bogolibo formulation, but it's much easier to do in the path integral formulation, which is what I'm going to now turn to. Okay. And also this, you know, this phi can have any value. The physics is independent of the value of phi. So any given system chooses some value of phi. So if you have a superfluid with some value of phi, well, okay, it's chosen a value. That doesn't seem like it done much. It's just an overall phase of the wave function. But if you bring two superfluids together, uh, they could have different values of phi. And the difference in phi are physically meaningful. Uh, and therefore the choice of phi that you made is sometimes called, well, usually called spontaneous symmetry breaking. Uh, you've broken a symmetry, which is uh, associated with the rotation of the phase of the Bose operator, um, which is essentially the symmetry of uh, conservation of number of particles. Again, I emphasize that doesn't mean the number of particles not conserved, it's still conserved. It's just that uh, this basis in which you don't conserve the number of particles um, has its nice clustering properties of observables. Okay. Any questions? <laughs> all right, great. So now I'm going to do all of this again, uh, but in the path integral language. Uh, and that's really very useful for many other things we're going to do. Um, we're going to, you know, once we get to more complicated systems of bosons uh, with more complex interactions, uh, we look at phase transitions, uh, then the path integral language has much, uh, you know, is a lot more convenient. And even for an ordinary superfluid like this, it's much more convenient to think in the path integral language to talk about states where phi is a function of position or time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, those are some non-equilibrium states that you could impose by you know, bringing two superfluids next to each other, putting pressure on a superfluid, applying a magnetic field, the boson would charge, and so on. So these are things we want to be able to do, not just look at the ground state of the uniform system. And is this uh, psi of r up to a factor just your original d uh, Oh, yes, it is. Yes, yes. And the factor is what? The root time? Uh, no, no, I think it's just one over the volume of the unit cell of the lattice space. Yeah, sorry. So the psi, yeah, I didn't mention in the notes. Uh, the commutator, the only difference between the psi and the v is that the commutator of v and v dagger is a delta, chronic delta, and the commutator of psi and uh, psi dagger is a Dirac delta. But that just gives you a volume of the unit cell. Okay, so now let's redo this whole uh, song and dance. 
uh, but using a pattern rule language for exactly the same theory. Uh, But this whole picture you know, really was the origin, as I said, uh, of the whole understanding of why is a superfluid uh, a state of broken symmetry, how that broken symmetry is responsible for superfluidity itself. Uh, and then once you add long range forces for, for the Higgs mechanism, uh, which we'll get to eventually. Okay, so now let's do the same theory uh, in the path and regular language. And I'm just going to go ahead and work in the continuum. Uh, this is not yet for the Bose gas. We'll get to the Bose gas, uh, the Bose Howard model a bit later, probably not today. What time is it? Okay, so let me just write down uh, the theory that we're going to look at. So the partition function. In the now I'm just working in the Garrett canonical ensemble, case e to the minus beta h is a path integral of some complex field psi of space and time. This is imaginary time now uh, of some action e to the minus an action, uh, and the action is the following. So if you have finite temperature, that everything is periodic in time. So psi of r and beta is psi of r at zero, and their beta one over temperature, uh, e tau. Okay, it's very simple, psi star psi d tau. I'm just going to take a quadratic dispersion. So we drag psi square to m. We have a chemical potential, this is minus mu psi squared, and the contact interaction Hello? with unit lattice spacing. Hello? Sky to the fourth. So, if you're, uh, I hope all of you have had a chance to look at some notes on uh, foreign state packet interval. Actually, I realized I also have some notes, I'll, I'll put them on the, on the website. Uh, but there are many textbooks. This is just uh, uh, the current state path integral we are writing down the same bubbly about Hamiltonian uh, in the continuum for now. This particular term is just the path integral uh, way of representing, uh, is also an integral over space. Uh, and we're we'll working at d dimensions of space. This term is simply the path integral representation of the fact that psi of r, psi dagger of r, um, have uh, atomic <clears throat> um, And this term, you should also note, uh, is, is a complex, it's, it's purely imaginary. It's a phase factor, sometimes called a very phase that appears uh, in the path of truth. It's, it's different from the you know, ordinary Feynman path integral of particles. Uh, where uh, if you do it in position space, you get a purely real action in imaginary time, it's kinetic energy plus, uh, plus potential energy. Uh, but if you do what's called the phase space path integral uh, over P and X of a particle or a harmonic oscillator, uh, then you will get such a term, which will be analog of that term will be P Q dot for a single particle. <coughs> Okay, I'll put some notes on, on how <coughs> on how that's derived. Okay, so this looks like a very complicated path integral to evaluate, um, but the general trick we're going to use over and over again when we take the path integrals uh, is use the saddle point method. If you're going to find some stationary point uh, where over this configuration space where S uh, doesn't vary as a saddle point of some kind. Uh, study that saddle point and then do Gaussian fluctuations about that point, uh, and that will pretty much. Uh, so all you really need to do in the end uh, is some kind of quadratic path integral, uh, which is similar to just doing the uh, the integral diagonalize the boundary of Hamilton, as we'll see. All right, everything okay there with the TV and the broadcast? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
All right, so as I said, how do we proceed when you want to uh, look at a saddle point? Uh, so we look for the saddle point. So the pattern goes up the side. Uh, and so we just want to solve ds d psi uh, equal to zero. And we want to do this, we're going to assume that it's space and time independent, x uh, and tau independent, saddle point. The psi is just a complex number then. And, and this thing disappears. This also disappears. Only these two matter. Uh, and therefore, you have minus mu. Sorry. Uh, what have I called it? Uh, okay. Minus mu psi squared plus u over 2 psi to the fourth. Zero. Uh, and this tells us that psi, and I'm going to write it this way, is square root of n naught times e to the i phi, where n naught is the old n naught, uh, which is mu over u. Let's diagonalize this quartic polynomial, and this is the answer. And now, now I'm, I'm explicitly using phi here uh, because uh, you know this only involves the modulus squared. And this phi will be exactly the phi uh, that I had there earlier in the operator representation. All right, so that's the saddle point. And then now we want to look at quadratic fluctuations, expand the action around the saddle point and see what you get. And that's entirely equivalent to what Bogolyubov did. Uh, but this is, you know, as you can see, a lot neater. We're not making any assumptions of k equals zero and k not equal to zero and all of that. Uh, we're just doing an honest path integral where we are uh, just doing the path integral by the saddle point method. All right, so we want to look at fluctuations about this. Uh, let me call this size zero here. Uh, so how do we parameterize the fluctuations? Okay, so we take our psi of R and T, uh, there's many ways to do it, but this is the, the more conventional and uh, elegant way. I'm going to say it's a square root of n0 plus n1 of r and tau and e to the i phi of r and tau. So when phi is a constant and n1 is zero, uh, then I have uh, the saddle point. And I now look at fluctuations about it and I allow them to be both space and time dependent. Uh, the reason I've written it this way is now you can see that uh, this N1 is precisely the local density fluctuation and phi is the phase. Uh, and this we're just going to insert this into the action and expand to quadratic order N1 and phi. Okay. Um, Right. Uh, the other interesting thing you can uh, check for yourself that this measure of the pattern review is also very simple in this way of doing it. And up to a normalization, d psi d star uh, is just dn1 d phi. Okay, so the only approximation really is the fact that n1, we're going to integrate n1 from minus infinity to infinity. But of course, we can't do that because the square root has to be positive. Uh, and so there's a lower bound on these fluctuations, which you're going to ignore. So that's the, the one of the approximations, other than the fact that also we're going to expand the quadratic order and one and five. Okay, so you just insert this in there and see what you get. So then the action uh, is some zero order term that we already know, we'll write out. Uh, and then you get uh, the remaining term, which are quadratic. Hello. Okay, so the first thing is that this, this term here where? now becomes explicitly uh, imaginary, uh, and it's the following. It's n1 and d theta d tau. Well, d theta or phi, sorry. My notes have theta. Well, okay, I'll stick to phi today. d phi d tau. So that comes directly from this term. There are some other terms that integrate, you know, 
Once you use periodic boundary, you can then give you a cost. And don't worry about those for now. Uh, so this, so what does this tell you? This, well, this is very much like P Q dot in a packet integral. It tells you that phi and n are canonically conjugate. So the phase of the condensate is canonically conjugate to the density fluctuations. Uh, so the time derivative of the phase is something like a density. Uh, and that's, of course, uh, crucial for various things, including the Jolson effect. Anyway, so this is what you get from this term over there. And the other terms are now, uh, in fact, we can work it out to all orders. I'll only write down the quadratic terms. Yeah, so you will get that's one half. U naught plus k squared over four n and not times. Uh, okay, now I've gone to momentum space. Sorry. Um, n one of k squared. So this is the cost for energy for density fluctuations. Uh, there's a cost U naught for a uniform density fluctuation. That's telling you that, that it's a compressible system. Uh, and and then there's and the most important term, which really explains the presence of a linear dispersion, uh, is this term that depends upon theta, which is n naught k squared for 2m. And it's theta of phi, sorry, excuse me. Phi sub k squared. So what you notice here is that if phi is a constant as a function of position, then because of the k squared here, there's no energy cost. So slow variations in phi cost an energy which is proportional to the gradient of phi squared. Now we have some understanding of what phase fluctuations spatially look like. A spatial fluctuation of phase give you an energy cost in proportion to gradient of the phase squared. Uh, the coefficient when you go to some renormalized theory is often called the uh, helicity modulus of the superfluid density. Um, and time fluctuations of phi are canonically conjugate to n1. Yes. Uh, U0 is U. Yes, sorry, thank you. Uh, Sabir, can you hear this now? Okay. All right, so now you can, you know, you can view this. You can just can you hear my voice coming out of the TV, severe? Relation, because this is precisely the back integral of a harmonic oscillator, one harmonic oscillator for each momentum k. Uh, this is like this, this is like the n is like a momentum. Uh, so this is like a p squared over 2m, where the mass is some number. You can ignore this k squared because you're looking at long wavelengths, which is some constant. Uh, and this is the displacement of the harmonic oscillator uh, with an energy that goes as k squared. And this just tells you that position and momentum are canonically conjugate. So from this, just by the mapping the harmonic oscillator, you can just read off the dispersion. Or if you are still more of a functional person, uh, you do one more integral. You do integrate over density fluctuations. Uh, and then uh, you'll get a even simpler theory. So now I do that over here. So I actually do the integral over n1. Um, and then I get a, a parent integral, this integral over theta. Uh, what will be the action? Is of the theta audio theta? working now? Yeah. So what will be the action of theta then? Uh, I'm the white chalk. So as theta, well, you just do the pad integral over n1, and you do that by just completing the square. Uh, just to check, you, you mean phi, right? Sorry, phi. Excuse me. Sorry. This is why I should have changed notation in my notes of uh, uh, theta. So I just complete the square um, and just do and uh, then do the integral integral n1. I'll get some dependence on phi. Just by looking at this, you can see what you're going to get is just uh, d phi d tau squared and uh, the inverse of this. So this is going to be looked something like this and sum on k 
uh, integral on d tau. So we have d phi dk d tau squared. And uh, I'll, I'll throw out this k, it's not important. It's in the notes if you want to keep it, times uh, one over uh, two u naught plus n naught over two m. Uh, actually, let me just make everything in space and time of the pi tau squared. Grad phi squared. And this is integral over space. Okay. So now that's a very appealing looking theory. Uh, it's the theory of a relativistic scalar field. Oh, sorry, I wrote it twice. This <laughs> thing there. Okay. So it's a massless relativistic scalar field uh, with, uh, you know, d phi d tau squared. Uh, and grad phi squared. And this one, from the values of these numbers here, as you can read off the value of the velocity of sound. All right. So we started with a non relativistic Bose gas. Uh, we condensed the particle in the ground state. We integrated out the density fluctuations. Uh, and that gave us uh, the theory of a linearly dispersing sound mode. Yes. Um, how is this observed experimentally? By the the existence of this mode by thermodynamics or by looking at long range correlations? Oh, uh, no, you can, you can actually see pressure waves. Uh, uh, so you can, you know, depending on what frequency you look at, uh, you can see just like, so the experiments are very similar to experiments you do to detect sound, ordinary sound. Uh, and, uh, but these occur in a different frequency uh, and momentum range than first sound, which is at much longer wavelengths at finite temperature. Uh, at zero temperature, this is the this is the pure infinitely long lived mode. This is all there is. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right. So let me draw another uh, another picture of this, and also draw a contrast uh, with you know things you may have heard. Uh, so let's take this potential over here. Where does it go? Uh, here, this potential, uh, and actually make a picture of it. So what have we done? So if I draw V of phi, uh, that has the form of the famous uh, Mexican hat potential. So this is psi, just complex number, and sort of V of psi. So that you know, looks something, this is zero here, it looks something like this, uh, with the Mexican hat rim over here, okay? Um, and I'm just plotting this function here. This is, this function here is V of psi. So what have we done? Well, what we did was we condensed a particle here. We, condensed, we took psi at some point along the bottom of the rim. Uh, and then we took the fluctuations about that point. And there are two types of fluctuations. There's the, the fluctuation in this direction, which I call N1. And then there's the fluctuation along the rim of the hat, which I call phi. Okay. So these we found, you know, uh, were expensive because there's a constant over here. So we integrated them out and we got a theory for these uh, phi fluctuations, which is the second sound mode. And so now you also notice something very important here, which distinguishes this. Is something I don't understand. Here. Yes. I, I would understood what you just said if you had a second order in time action. Yeah. But N1 is not really an independent mode of phi. It's Correct. And conjugate. That's right. So we didn't really integrate out anything. We just wrote it in second order formalism rather than first order formalism. Yes, you're right. You're I, I misspoke. I mean, or I wasn't precise enough. Uh, yeah, I didn't take it out any de degrees of freedom. I just went from a phase space formulation uh, to a coordinate space formulation of the parenthetical. 
And, and once I interrupted you, I have one yeah. more. In the top blackboard, you have a sum over k. Yes. Which I interpret to mean that you work in finite volume. Whereas um, you can make it an integral, okay, if you want, then you have to, there's factors of volume and so on. Yeah. But uh, right now, I'm. Well, the physics is completely different because in finite volume, the symmetry is not broken. In infinite volume, it is. Right. So, in uh, at least for this lecture, I'm just always referring to infinite volume case, and I'm writing expressions in finite volume and taking implicit limit of the finite infinite volume limit. Yeah. Um, all right. So what I was saying was that there, are, as Claudia correctly pointed out, n one and phi are canonically conjugate, uh, and uh, there's only you know one mode here, which is this, uh, which is this phi fluctuation. Now the situation is very different for a relativistic scalar field. If you take the Higgs theory of a scalar field and ignore the gauge field for now, uh, you'll get the same picture, except you'll have a second order time derivative. You won't have this term here. Uh, you'll have a term like d psi d tau squared. Uh, so when you go through the same procedure, then you'll find a very different answer. Um, you still get, at least for this theory, you still get this phi mode with the linear dispersion. You still get the Goldstone mode, but you get another particle with a with a you know uh, finite energy, and that's the Higgs boson, this longitudinal fluctuation. But that's only present for the relativistic case. Uh, that's not present here for this non-relativistic Bose gas because the density mode is just canonically conjugate to the phi mode. And of course, in the true Higgs mechanism, there's long-range interaction, and so the phi mode. Uh, disappears uh, and becomes a double and z boson in the theory of weak interactions. Or if you have a charged superfluid, uh, the phi mode becomes a plasmon. So the plasmon is the analog of the w and z bosons. Really. Okay. All right. So that I've covered a lot of ground here. This is basically reviewing. Uh, the theory of the weakly interacting Bose gas in the continuum. Um, there's only one ground state. Uh, the ground state is always a superfluid, at least for weak interactions. Uh, and that superfluid has a very simple uh, excitation spectrum. Uh, at low energies, it has a linearly dispersing phase fluctuation law. And that's all there is to it. Uh, uh, no. Okay, now you could imagine that in the continuum that uh, could you get anything else? Well, if you take the real system, helium 4 which is, lives in the continuum, it, you do get under pressure, helium 4 forms a solid. Uh, and that involves breaking cross of symmetry. Uh, and that can happen. That's in principle a property also uh, of a path integral like this in some high density limit. Uh, but that's very hard to study, and it, it tends to be a very strong first-order transition. Um, and so we won't go into that. Uh, another possibility you could imagine happening in the continuum, uh, what if uh, U is attractive? Uh, you could imagine a situation where the interaction is such that two bosons like to form a bound state, uh, but then pairs of bosons, the molecules, repel each other. Then you get a situation where the, the pair of bosons both condenses. That is still a superfluid, uh, but it's a slightly different superfluid. It's a superfluid of pairs of bosons, not a single boson. Uh, and the way you see a difference uh, is that the vortices, the quantization of circulation in the vortex, uh, the quantization of circulation in the condensate uh, is different from that you've talked about here. We'll get to that later. Okay. But the basic answer is in the continuum, uh, nearly always uh, the ground state just is superfluid. So, to get something else, some other new type of ground state, we really have to go back to the lattice. That's the simplest place where you can see other ground states appear uh, at large U. Uh, yeah, so that reminds me. So, for helium 4, you know, U is not small. Uh, and so, uh, but nevertheless, the theory is that I presented um, is still morally correct. Uh, 
And let me, let me just make a few remarks on that. This was a quite important and source of much confusion. So, Uh, is it a right time to ask one question? Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, in the canonical ensemble, uh, it naively feels that the number conservation is not violated. Um, so uh, uh, can one argue from the Goldstone theorem point of view about uh, the gapless mode or uh, there is some other argument about the gapless mode? Uh, well, okay, so it depends whether you're talking about uh, uh, infinite volume limit or not. I mean, those are two different things. You can distinguish canonical versus grand canonical ensemble from whether you're truly in an infinite volume limit or not. If you're truly in the infinite volume limit, there's no difference between the canonical and grand canonical ensemble. Uh, and you can work in either way you prefer. You can certainly go through these arguments in the canonical ensemble. Uh, you'll just find that it's more complicated in the end, it makes no difference. And there'll be some problem in the homework where you'll see that. But if you're in a finite box, then yes, uh, then what happens is that this Goldstone mode uh, gets split into a discrete set of modes. And the energy spinning uh, is roughly proportional to the inverse volume of the box. Basically, what you have to worry about in a finite box uh, is just a single rotor variable, a single phi. Uh, which is the zero momentum component of phi. So that zero momentum component behaves like a rotor, like a particle on a circle, whose mass is proportional to the volume of the box. So it's a very heavy particle uh, and has very uh, uh, finely spaced energy levels, uh, which are kind of the remnant of the Goldstone box. Uh, so this uh, gapless mode, um... Uh, then, um, so the Goldstone theorem uh, still holds in the canonical ensemble, even if the symmetry is not broken uh, in the infinite system limit. Uh, is that the statement? Uh, no, I would think the correct statement would be that in the infinite volume limit, the symmetry is broken in both ensembles and the Goldstone theorem holds. I see. And um, I, what symmetry is broken in the canonical ensemble? It is definitely probably not the number conservation. Some other symmetries. Oh, no, I, I think this. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry to be. I have confused things maybe a little bit, but it's more of a semantic problem. I think. Uh, I think the conventional terminology is we consider the symmetry broken in the infinite long term limit, uh, and it's more of a technical choice whether you choose to do the calculations in the canonical or the grand canonical ensemble. But the technical choice of the grand canonical ensemble is invariably a lot simpler because it has this clustering property. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah so you get into all, you know, you tie yourself in knots if you don't have your theory that doesn't have the clustering property. Uh, and then what it means by a broken symmetry and not very really confusing. So I think it's preferred, maybe my preferred preference would be just work in the grand canonical ensemble and then things are clear. And then check that the answers in the grand canonical in the canonical ensemble are also the same. But the conceptual framework of spin symmetry breaking is obviously much clearer in the grand canonical picture. All right, what was I going to say? Yes, so there's, we have a superfluid state. Um, and there's two different quantities that characterize it. Uh, one quantity that is, uh, so it has a Bose condensate. Um, and what that means is that the expectation value of B0 or B dagger zero, uh, B0 uh, is some N naught over B. Okay, and the important point is that N naught is not equal to N for U not equal to zero. And indeed, you can in helium four and not, uh, you know, it's like ten percent. It can be very much less than n for large U. So the size of the condensate itself, which is just a measure of how many particles are in the zero momentum state, uh, 
can be quite small. Okay, but there's another separate characterization, uh, which I'll call the superfluid. Uh, I'm going to call it the stiffness. It's often called the density, but that's really very confusing uh, in the cases where you don't have continuous translational symmetry on Galilean variance. So which, what is the superfluid stiffness? The superfluid stiffness, you would define the following way. Uh, you take some state phi, uh, but you allow phi to be a function of position. So this is some slowly varying state phi of R, where phi is different at different points uh, in an infinite volume. And you look at the changes in energy. So what is E uh, minus E naught? What is the energy of this phi state? Where is the phi E naught is the phi constant state? What is this equal to? Well, since the theory is local and you really making very long wavelength deformations of phi, uh, you would say that this is some integral over all space. Um, and then you'll have the gradient of phi squared. And there's some coefficient. And that coefficient I'll call rho sub s over two. Now this is a perfectly well-defined equation. This is units of energy. Phi has units of, it is a well-defined, it goes from zero to two pi. You can't rescale it. It's the phase of the wave function, whatever it is. It's a dimensionless number. So rho sub s is, a perfectly well-defined quantity uh, for a superfluid. And in fact, in the bulk of theory, we got some value from this. We can work it out uh, what this is, what this number of rows of S is. And the dimensions of rows of S, uh, you can just see from here, um, our energy is length to the two minus D. So those are the units of it. So in two dimensions, it has a spatial dimension, it has the units of uh, just energy. Uh, in three dimensions, there's energy per length. Uh, and that's why I'm not calling it a, a density. If you look, read old books on the helium 4, you'll say there's a superfluid density. Uh, it's not really a density, it only becomes a density when you put strange things like h bar squared over 2 over m over here. Uh, where what m do you put in here? Well, if you have gathered any variance, it's clear what m. But if you don't have Galilean there, it's not clear what's in. So it's much cleaner to just not put that there and talk about this quantity, which is perfectly well defined. All the values are on the continuum. Okay. So now the question is what is this quantity, the rows of S? So for the Bogley Bob theory, if you work it out, uh, it has a very simple value. Uh, let's see. I haven't written it out, but. If I remember, let's see. I don't read my glasses. Yeah, so for the Bogolibov theory, if you look at what is the value of rows of S, uh, rows of S turns out to be uh, the total density. Uh, to leading order uh, uh, total density of h bar squared over 2m, where this is the bare mass of the bosons uh, and n is the total density. Okay, so this is the case uh, in the Bolivar theory. For weak u, so this is for u, it's u much, much less than some, some units, one. Okay, so now in helium four, however, U in whatever units you choose to measure it is not small. It's in fact huge. It's a hard sphere uh, with, and the gas is very dense. It's not a dilute gas, it's a very dense gas. So what do you expect? Well, we already found uh, in, for small U that there's what, called the depletion of the condensate. Not all the particles in the condensate, there's a correction uh, associated with the exponential part of the wave function that I wrote down. And so for large U, we can expect that this is true. If the condensate disappears. Uh, and in fact, in helium-4, it's about 10% of the particles when you measure it by neutron scattering. The number of particles in the condensate is very small. So this, 
the number of particles in zero momentum state is very small. On the other hand, if you measure this quantity, rho sub s, now in the simplest theory, that's also proportional to the density of particles, which is also the density of particles in the condensate. Uh, but there you find that this could be completely different. In fact, in rho sub in helium four, uh, this result is actually exact uh, with Galilean invariants for any u. So, in some sense, the helium four, even though its condensate is so weak, is a perfect superfluid at zero temperature uh, at t equals zero. Uh, so I'm not going to prove that, but uh, anyway, uh, you can look at the structure of the action and what we define and see that this is the case. Uh, so, yeah, so what, what's all, well, you know, sometimes you often see that, you know, especially people with cold items making statements that, well, uh, they found a weakly interacting condensate where the condensate is large and it's not, it's a better, better superfluid than helium 4. And in fact, that's not true. Yes, the condensate is very small than helium-4, uh, but the superfluid density is still actually the maximum value. It doesn't go down. And, and so this sort of emphasizes that when you make a change of phase, and I showed earlier, you're changing not just the phase of the condensate, you're changing the phase of every particle. Really, the whole ground state is a superfluid. Every particle is associated uh, with the change in phase. Uh, and this quantity, the superfluid density, is something you'd measure uh, in some experiments involving, you know, flow of current, a flow of, uh, for example, in the charge of the fluid, it, this is the quantity that appears in the London penetration depth, how the system responds to a magnetic field. Uh, that's involves rho sub s and not n naught. All right, so that's just a little aside to say that this theory, although a theory for weakly interacting particles is in fact uh, a perfectly good theory or even four, apart from not getting the numbers right. Qualitative, it gives everything correct. And this was the source of a lot of confusion and arguments, uh, very bitter arguments in the 60s by many famous physicists. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So rho sub s is rigorously defined. Yes. But is n zero really rigorously defined? Yes. Uh, you, you do a neutron scattering measurement. You look at the structure factor and the, and the zero momentum, scat the forward scattering amplitude will give you n zero. So you measure, you say you have a superfluid, uh, and then you send in some, some, some neutron or some particle that couples to the density. So you have your density of particles that couples to some source, uh, we call it H. Does the neutron scatter from a particle in an excited state? Yeah, so you measure the, the density density correlation process. What neutron scattering cross section measures uh, is the n of r tau n of zero zero uh, times e to the i k r minus omega tau. So by looking at the neutron scattering experiment, you can measure this quantity as of k and omega. Okay, so that will give you, let me just even integrate over all frequency, do inelastic scattering. Uh, and s of k, the structure factor, you can measure s of k and omega too if you want. Well, anyway, S of k and omega has a, has a term delta of k, uh, delta of omega times the condensate plus some regular part. So this part will be the inelastic terms. So that certainly will be there, but there'll be a delta function forward elastic scattering contribution that will give you the value of n naught. This is surprising because in analogous problems in high energy physics, yeah. Uh, the condensate is not well defined. Whereas because you have a gate charge. Here, there's no gate charge. Even without gate charge. Uh, no, it's well defined. So in QCD, the first thing is psi bar psi, and rho sub s is what well, well, phi square. Right, exactly. So I was so going to say like that. Very well defined, but psi bar psi depends on the regularization scheme and those of other things. I guess this is what Edward did in mind when he asked the question. Yeah, so I think the point is that uh, this is a theory which is UV finite. Uh, it's just, you know, the Hamiltonian or down with the first order time derivative uh, is perfectly finite. The notion at very high energies, this theory is theory of just free particles. You know, the spectrum completely. There's no, there's no, 
there are no vacuum fluctuations of antiparticles here. But even if there were, this still would be well defined. Uh, I think psi bar psi. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there may be because you also have some bare quark masses, but suppose you had a theory with no bare quark masses, then I think correlation function of psi bar psi would be well defined. <laughs> it would, you, if you actually broke uh, chiral symmetry, I think, you, this is a gauge invariant order parameter and, and it has a well defined value. No, <laughs> we can discuss that. It depends on the scheme. Okay. <laughs> well, I wonder if you'd measure the same N0 with neutrinos as with neutrons, if you could do it. In other words, yeah. that's a way to ask whether. Yeah. Uh, you have to find something, but it might depend on the probe. Right. Not just on the system. No, I don't think so. I th okay, maybe the answer is that there's no infinite Dirac C here. And you're doing relative stick fermions, you have the infinite Dirac C to worry about. There's no such thing here. I mean, if you did the same thing from graphene, you would bottom of the bag and so on. Okay, great. It's, uh, any questions uh, online from India? Elliot, <clears throat> uh, um, you have you should mute Oh, sorry. Whoops. May I ask a question? Yes, please go ahead, Elliot. <laughs> um, uh, uh, about this question that came up earlier about the C number substitution of A0 or rather B0 by a C number and so on, and whether this is legitimate and so on. Uh, let me just uh, mention that what we proved back in 2005 in the physical review letters is that the C number substitution is perfectly rigorous uh, in the thermodynamic limit in the sense that it makes a mistake in the energy of the order of one, uh, not of order n. And you can more or less, moreover do this for any number of operators you want, not just B0, you could take any of them and substitute in a C number. For each time you do this, you make a mistake of order one. So don't do too many if you want to get the right answer. Uh, and <clears throat> The rule is you have to do this consistently. That is, every time you see this operator in your Hamiltonian, you do it consistently. You don't substitute sometimes and not other times. I mean, you consistently substitute. And after you've made the substitution, you then compute, the, if we're talking about the ground state energy, you compute the ground state energy in this new Hamiltonian where you have the C numbers and then minimize the energy with respect to the C numbers. In other words, you regard them as parameters and you minimize the energy of the resulting quantum Hamiltonian with respect to these parameters. If you do that consistently and correctly, then you get the right answer in the thermodynamic limit and end of story. I mean, that's completely rigorous and using coherent states, you can prove this. Okay, I mentioned this in, in case this is of interest to anyone. Yeah, that, if you can maybe put the reference to your paper in the chat, I'm sure students would be well, able to. I can give you the reference if you want. It's in 2005. Uh, where is okay. it? Well, I'll dig it up. We'll do letters. You'll find it. All right, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the students? All right, great. So uh, I just, the notes are on the website. We'll try to get a homework to you. And uh, see you on Monday. Then.